Hey everyone, Eric Watson here, Freelance Twitter Player of Games, Roger Borger, Quarter Videos and Tabletop Role Playing Aficionado. Welcome to the Monday edition of Bye Bye Weekly Behind the Scenes DM Only Live Stream Crafting the Deep, which I build right and fair for our next session of Call from the Deep. If you're playing characters Gotwald, Max Sauber, or Toro, this is not the right stream for you. In fact, we'll even be here this Friday. But for the rest of you, of course, you are welcome. We stream our D&D sessions live on YouTube every Friday. You can join, except for this Friday. You can join our official Discord server with invite link in the description below. If you'd like to support the channel, please check out patreon.com slash Watson. For our campaign, we use Roll20 for streaming. I use OBS Studio, so if you haven't gotten the update yet from uh, last week's episode, we've got uh, birthdays coming up this week for like half our party. And uh, we're going to be taking the week off of doing, or just, I guess, taking a Friday off because I'm still here. You still get me. I'm going to be streaming the crafting episodes today and again on Thursday. So we just don't get the the D on D on Friday, which means we're going to get four crafting episodes before the next uh, Friday episode. That is a lot of prep work, which is probably good because we have a whole gigantic dungeon module to sort of figure it out before the players, of course, get their uh, sticky fingers all over it, as they often do. We have made it inside to the final enemy mission, the Sawagan Stronghold, through the passage I wanted them to go through, which was nice. Uh, we got through the dungeon, we met Borgus. Now we gotta figure out where they're gonna go next. I've kind of teased the fact that they're gonna have to deal with the arena. We put the Triton, we moved the Triton, who was originally in the dungeon along with Borgus. I thought, why put two NPCs in the same area that we're gonna meet and introduce and have the party befriend, why not just separate them? So let's go ahead and put one in the arena instead of like two random Sawagans fighting. And that way that pulls the party into having to interact with the arena instead of saying, oh, well, that's not something we should go anywhere near, which would otherwise make total sense in this situation. Uh, now, I haven't quite decided, I'm probably not gonna like roll initiative once they see uh, the tr which I, I teased at the end of the last episode, right? That the Triton is actually literally being, uh, it is in the arena with a giant octopus currently locked in battle. So mechanically, like technically, okay, we got to roll initiative and everybody's taking turns, but I'm not really going to do that. Instead, I'm going to play it like, I don't know if I can cite specific video games that do this, but like you'll see in the, in the foreground or the background uh, where there's clearly like people attacking and they're like they're animating like they're attacking, but there's no like health bar yet. They're just kind of waiting for the players to like inter like interact with them. That might not be quite to the level I'm, of fakery I'm gonna do here. Like if, but I, I will let the players do like a sidebar essentially. Like I will let them decide like, okay, how do we handle the situation? What's the plan? Because that's a lot to take in. They they can just in fact I think they can actually see because I didn't put dynamic lighting on the tiered seats here. So like Gottwald from here. Okay, you can't actually see anything. Um, I think if he stepped here, he could, maybe not. Uh, okay, not quite. They can't actually see anything from here. But I did describe the fact, and I remember them saying that I described the fact, although I'll have to repeat that because it'll be two weeks till we play, that there were multiple levels. It's a dome arena thing happening. Uh, that's actually, this part is lower, like by 30 feet compared to where the stands are. I mean, it's like a, you know, stadium. And there's dozens of Swagan around here, about 50 of them, actually. I did go ahead and put two Swagan champions down here at the entrance just to prevent the players from literally running in, grabbing them, and running out. So it forces them to do some kind of shenanigans. Um, what I'll probably allow them to do is some, you know, again, sidebarring, some level of preppery while still being like, okay, well, monitoring the time. And then if they haven't done anything, then like a round happens between the Octopus and the Triton. But they're basically going to have to interact with this arena as their next event. How they're going to do that, what they're going to use to get out of it. If they even want to just stir up the hornet's nest and then use um, uh, Sovra's rope trick spell, because she actually mentioned it last week. Now, whether she'll remember it in like two weeks, who knows, but you know, I'm totally willing for them to use one of their tools they have at their disposal, uh, disposal to get out of a nasty situation. But I'm looking forward to putting them in this situation and kind of forcing them because this is one of the NPCs they have come to hire and clearly walking in here and trying to fight everybody. Although I'm sure Toral's willing to just like, you know, launch a Hunger of Hadar, which if you could do that, I don't know what the range on that thing is. It's probably too damn much because spells are so powerful. You know, maybe that would cause a good enough distraction, for example, and you could just create kind of that kind of chaotic scene, which is, I admit, 
difficult to do on a virtual tabletop when I'm having to literally move like tokens around and try to simulate things without having to like literally break it down by every single token in every single turn. Uh, so they will have to deal with that. There's still a lot of places for them to go before and after they do that. I say before, there's, they're really going to have to deal with this next. So I guess after um, they have all these different directions, although Borges has already so told them and Kish will be able to confirm that that really there's nothing else on level three that they need to go towards. Technically, there are stairs, I think, that go up to level two, I guess, here. But yeah, right there uh, from area 60 to area 20. No, that can't be right. I think I thought area 20 led up to the first level. Where does the stairs in level 60 go? Let me look down at this for a second. Does it actually say where they go? A flight of stairs. Steps lead down to the south. Oh, okay. It's just built in from one level to the other. All right, so there's no actual staircase there. So the only stairs are from the two, and that's, I'm looking at the original uh, module map, the black and white map. The, the only staircases are in the upper uh, northwest and northeast, which is where they need to go, which they're going to have to fight something or cause some kind of distraction to make it up to either of those rooms. I think we already filled them out full of enemies. I guess I could go ahead and slap enemies on the lower half, but just to make sure I cover my bases, but I really don't expect them to go down there much. So the left room is the storage room that has the shell sharks, which I did put little like castle symbols on them instead of their usual color numbers to remind myself that they are special sharks. Secret door with that big nasty glyph of warding trap on there. Um, probably reflavor the stone crushing thing is like ice wall or something just to add insult injury and then maybe put some uh make sure there's some treasure in this room i guess i need to pull the actual you know i didn't do that yet i pulled some of the numbers but i didn't finish it so let's go back to level three the teeny tiny tokens so we've got 53 i'm really just going to jump back and forth between these two i guess i could Goes there. Oops. This is actually gonna be tedious as hell. Room 60. Actually, let's grab a couple of these. 59, 58, and 60. For the bottom, which we haven't filled out yet. So that's 59, that's 60. And a lot of this, at least initial prep, is just me on roll 20 doing stuff to get these. Whoa. Get these maps ready. 58. And we've got the side rooms, which is 53 and 55 on the east side. Okay. So that is these two, I guess. 53 and 55. It's just all full of dudes. That's it. It's just it's just full of dudes. You shouldn't go to any of these places. And I'm telling them over and over again, don't go to those places. 56 and 57 on the left side, which is there. I think that should be all the numbers. I might have missed that one in the upper left. How was your game, Lumpy? 52. Oh, I already had 52 in there. My bad. Okay, so I think all the numbers are done. Actually, I did the side rooms already. I guess I just didn't do little of these bottom three rooms. So... There was... They're just both guard posts and a barracks. It's nasty. Do I want to grab... No, I don't need to grab all these. Let's grab... It's just Swaggins, Champions, and Coral Smashers. Shit tons of them. Also, weirdly, the final enemy uses a different Swaggin token than the Call from the Deep one. I guess Call from the Deep doesn't have the official art. So it uses a shit ton of those three stat blocks over and over and over again in certain quantities. We will continue to do so, but, and I don't know, I'm not really going to track, like, how many reinforcements they get. What I really should do is just have a sidebar of reinforcements, which I think 
they already say is like four Sawagans, a Coral Smasher, and a Champion or something like that. And then use that to mess up the players if I feel like they're lingering around too much. Populating levels with dudes. I feel like playing a, like, what is it, like a Dungeon Keeper or something? <laughs> Just spawning in all these dudes down there. 35 Sawagan. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. That's 35. Oh, sorry, it's 45. Why did I say 35? Uh, 40, 5, 10 Coral Smashers, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, this is, the only reason I'm doing this, honestly, is if they have some kind of reconnaissance that they can do, just so they can see the number of tokens that are down here. <laughs> Only reason I'm actually populating this. Seven champions, two deep divers, and two wave shapers. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. Like the, the wave shapers up here. Two wave shapers. Uh, one. Two, and there's also six shell sharks. I don't think I actually have the deep diver uh, available right here. Let's grab them right there. Different flavors of Sawagan. I think we fought, I mean, we haven't fought the wave shaper yet, so I need to make sure we have at least one battle with the wave shaper. I think we fought the others though. Two, those guys, four of them. Two, three, four. And shell sharks swimming everywhere. It's a lot of dudes. A lot of dudes. Come here, shell sharks. Awesome map by Bear Gardener, by the way. One, two, three, four, five. Six, just fucking hilarious. And there's a gate down there. I'm not even sure I finished dynamic lighting here. Oh, I guess I did, okay. All right, so then the other areas are 58 and 59, which are the two guard posts. 59 is abandoned, apparently. Why? Swagging champion and one Swagging, okay. Base there. And 58 has two champions and six to walk in. Let's go like that. Uh, champion. Oh, I'm getting to recognize these tokens. Okay. I think I've covered them all now. Don't have doors in place. Are these supposed to be portcullises, like gates? I think they are. D Ron's gate. Always with the net traps. You guys with your net traps, they're everywhere. How good can a net trap operate underwater? Find that a little suspicious. So I guess we actually mark these as windows. For the portcullises. Just doing all this, I'm not really paying much mind to putting these in certain spots or anything like that, because I don't think the players are going to ever get near here, but I'm doing this just to cover my bases. Telling them over and over again, especially with their allies, like, down here is crawling with dudes, not a good idea. There's no treasures, no authority, it's just dudes everywhere. Stay away. I think that covers... Pretty much all of level three, right? Because the two sides were 
also just living quarters, which would have been uh, 54 and 56 mainly. And the arena is still the like, basically they're already going to hit the, the the interesting places, right? The dungeon they hit was interesting. The arena I'm going to force them to interact with, and then they'll have to go either right or left, uh, which I won't have any say about that, and neither will the allies. 54 has 20 off-duty Sawagan here. Did I already slap those in there? I guess I did. Two Sawagans. Noise of melee here. We certainly hope with a guard post. C58. Okay. And then 56 has the wave shapers in there. Does it mention... There is a what the typical patrol is, because I think that's what I've been doing. Patrols in the fortress. Routinely send patrols on level 2 of the fortress as a security measure, specifically level 2. Unless the character is extremely stealthy and careful, they are bound to encounter patrol at some point. Okay, that's... I'm, I'm, I think I missed that first sentence. So, specifically level 2, they send patrols out. Level 2 is the one I know the least about, so that's the one we need to do the most uh, prep on, I think. You know what? That's a good point, Lumpy. Fish are often fucked up by net traps. We're in a Gobbo adventure. Heist of a Goblin King Sarcophagus and repatriating back to Dargoon. Nice. Yeah, that's a good point. All right, fine, fine, fine. Net traps work just fine. I'm not actually... I guess, yeah. For some reason, I'm going to picture a net trap. The only one I can picture, because I'm a landlubber is the one that's, uh, you're like walking along. Actually, I guess that's more of a, like the, the snare trap that I'm picturing. Well, it works as a net. And like the net is hidden and the whole thing like comes up, uh, you know, and is like, I don't know, spring loaded to wrap everybody up, but lift them up into the ground. Uh, obviously the nets here, there must be like weighted nets or something. Installed in the ceiling of the short corridor leading south is a large net trap. The net falls when a creature releases the rope, holding it in place. The net is not hidden. So these are not even traps. These are just like extra defense that guards can use. 10 foot by 20 foot net fails net falls from the ceiling. That's a that's a big fucking net. 20 foot. Each creature standing under the net as it falls must make a successful DC 16. Deck semming through it or be restrained. Again, is it's gotta be weighted though, because a net's or it's there's I don't know, man. I'm picturing it underwater and it's like I guess you're you're pulling it. Holding it in place. I just I feel like sometimes the designers forgot this area was underwater. <laughs> I guess somebody's just like got a net up there caught on something and just yank it and you're just like pulling it and you grab people in it. I don't know. It all feels kind of silly. A trap even worked on the predator, man. Yeah. Come on, kill me. Come on. <laughs> I fucking love that movie. What if we made an eighties action movie for the first third and then at some point, a fucking even more badass alien kills, like, every single one of them. One by one, like a horror movie. Like a slasher. <laughs> what a crazy fucking movie. What about the upper right one? Did we look twice at that one? This one... Okay, this one could be the opportunity to fight the Wave Shaper. I think this Wave Shaper is designed to retreat, though. In room 48... Walking champions bring four coral smashers for patrol duty. A wave shaper watches the range from the foot of the stairs, and two deep divers are nearby. That's crazy. I didn't even put the deep divers on here, did I? That's a huge amount of dudes. A champion. There's no regular Sawagan in here? Did I mess this room up then when I put four Sawagan? Or six Sawagan? What was I doing? Oh, I'm on the wrong one. 48. Sorry. No, this is the right one. 48 is up here. Yeah. A Swagon champion is bringing four coral smashers, a wave shaper, and two deep divers. That is nasty. 
Coral Smashers and Wave Shapers. Coral Smashers are these guys. Oh, that is that one. Okay. I wonder why I put this comp up there. So Coral Smashers are the ones that I had like the Chitinous Claw instead of a... Yeah, Chitin Fist. I reflavored their like Warhammer. I feel like weird to have underwater creatures with Warhammers. Uh, otherwise, they just have more health than... I'm not even sure they do more damage than a Swoggin. Oh, actually, yeah, they're way stronger. Razor Swoggin's got a plus three to hit. And only a plus one modifier. So yeah, Coral Smasher is a lot stronger. Plus five to hit. And they've got a plus three modifier to attack. Yikes. So those guys are way stronger. There's actually no regular Swoggin in here. Is that right? It's just the champion, four Coral Smashers, one, two, which we didn't really get to fight with them last time because uh, Toral kind of talked them out, I guess. So he's preparing. Let's say he's preparing them for duty right there because he's like the seaweed growing there. Wave Shaper by the door and two Deep Divers are just nearby. There's nobody in 49. And Deep Divers are the Angler guys, which we just fought. Which I thought was kind of a cool guy to do. Although it does take his action to do his thing, so having him pretty much by himself made him a little bit not as spiff. But it just means he's they'll be more respectful of these creatures when they see them next time. So this is actually a much stronger room up here than I was first looking at. Uh, once a swag and swag. You could also play a fun thing where like they could be partially hidden in the seaweed if the players attack them. Now the party, the giant seahorse, I think is heading this way, although you could argue it goes south instead. Um, but that might complicate things for the players in terms of, well, that went east, that's causing a ruckus, maybe we'll head west. Or maybe they'll head east after it and thinking, oh, it'll cause a ruckus and we'll slink in afterwards. So I'll have to decide which direction I want the seahorse to actually flee in. And the answer is whichever makes things more interesting for the game. <laughs> right now, I don't have a good answer to that. What I could do if the party really lingers a while, they try to short rest, I could have a patrol of Swagin coming back, having wrangled the seahorse to return it to the dungeons, and then the, they'll have to deal with that as a complication in their little heist plan. The other complication is Wave Shaper is designed to flee upstairs. Uh, once the Swagin spot the party, the Wave Shaper tries to flee up the stairs to find help. Characters farthest into the room can run and escape. The players state their intentions quickly enough. That doesn't make any sense. The two upper levels have been cleared. Can lead to swag and enough swag in various parts of the level to devastate the party. If the shaper gets away, he returns to join the fight along with a guard patrol. These forces arrive in the area 3d6 plus 6 rounds later. I'm good, because I'm really going to keep track of that. Uh, but that's always interesting to create a complication in a heist situation is that some of the enemies can either be uh, setting off an alarm or just fleeing, which would also alert others, and that forces the players to be like, "Oh shit, we got to take that that one out to stop others from coming." Can cast a message and comprehend languages, so I guess they can communicate. But these wagon are not. There's not going to be any. I don't think opportunity or reason for. This is not going to be like a sunblight situation where they can talk their way out of things. These guys are very militant and devoted and manipulated by the mind flayers. Pack of sharks chasing the seahorse. Yeah, I, I imagine this walking literally keeps sharks like dogs. I mean, they have shark telepathy. I mean, there could be, should be more sharks around, but I think there's a good enough of, amount of sharks where we can, the we an adequate, an adequate number of sharks, one might say. Rarely, rarely are sharks described as being an adequate amount. Wave Shaper has a nasty bite. He's gonna do cold damage as part of his bite. Oh, roll twenty fucked up here. The wave. This is. Supposed to be a, a trait, not part of his bite attack. I think he's supposed to have multi-attack. That was just a straight up error. Multi-attack, there we go. The Wave Shaper makes two attacks, one with its bite and one with its claws, or it can use Whirlpool once per day. Target a body of water at least 50 feet square and 25 feet deep. 
causing a whirlpool to form in the center of the area. Are you talking about 50 feet wide? Jesus Christ. It forms a vortex that is 5 feet wide at the base, up to 50 feet wide at the top, 25 feet tall. Well, that's going to be fun to figure out in a top-down battle map. You can swim away from the vortex winning on a DC 14 athletics. That's actually a fun thing to do to people in a in a combat situation where they're fighting other creatures, but would this vortex not like fuck up his own people? Make a DC 14 say strength save on a failed save creature takes 2d8 bludgeoning damage is caught in the vortex until it ends. A creature takes hack damage isn't caught in the wow, so it just constantly damages you. I don't think it's concentration, it just lasts for a minute or until I'm until he's incapacitated. Okay. Well, that's interesting. Some sort of shark <laughs> shark typhoon or shark hoon? <laughs> oh man, didn't they make like four of those movies? It's like you can't talk about running a joke into the ground. Like you know, people only really even gave a shit about the first one because it had a funny name, and then the fact that we actually just made the movie, and then they made like four other movies, which good for them, I guess. Hopefully we get a chance to use a wave shaper at some point, because I think that's the only swagon we have not completely used yet. So that's really level three is is just gonna be the arena, which could be crazy and exciting and chaotic, depending on how they deal with it. Uh in fact, I guess I need to refamiliarize myself with the arena before we move on. Which is 53, I think. And then just one of those two upper rooms, really. Uh, in the northwest or northeast to get them to level two. Uh, arena proper. Life somewhat lower than the rest of the level. The walls rise 30 feet from the floor to the lower edge of the gallery. A clear quartz dome rests on the four edges of the gallery and arches over the arena. And the gallery is tiered on three levels with 10 feet between levels. The uppermost tier is 50 feet above the floor of the combatants area. Big old stadium. On the lowest tier in the center of the south side. Oh, that's down here, isn't it? Okay, so I actually need to move this slightly. Row bench is broken by three special seats. The center and western seats, largest and most ornately decorated, reserved for the Baroness and Baron, and the eastern seat, larger and better decorated than the ordinary bench. But not so finely as the Baronesses and Barons is for Blade Master Makat. Is there any info I can give about Blade Master Makat? Because he seems like he could be mini boss material. Mini boss. Bow, 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 bow. So that means this dude sits here. Nope, that's yeah. So walking blade master. And he's got like his buddies. I think are here. I don't know. Twelve. Wait, I'm going to the wrong room. Fifty-three, forty-nine, five. So walking champions. I think I just divided the the champions up. I only have four on here. Uh, warriors and lieutenants scattered around the area. Let's walk into the galley with their usual weapons and equipment. The characters enter any part of the arena. What they can see depends on their point of entry and the extent of their precautions and concealment. Anyone entering the area of arena floor demands immediate attention unless they're invisible, otherwise cloaked from view. The swag and spot intruders, the crowd erupts in a chaos. Champions rush forward to attack, which I've only got two down there for start. Um, I don't know where the proper entrance is for the arena. If there's a dome over the entrance, then actually it's not easy for the people in the gallery to get in. Right? Maybe there's like, I don't know, there's some kind of, they can swim over here or something. I'm not sure how that works. Versus having to go like all the way around and up through here. Because of the way it's written, I think it's just designed for like everybody just suddenly swims into the arena. But I, I like the fact that the arena can has like this dome over it, which it mentions it does for like keeping combatants inside. Intrusion in the gallery is not as dangerous and swung and absorbed by the battle taking place below. What's too bad is that if the party had like a bard or a cleric or somebody, they could actually affect this battle from afar just by using like bardic inspiration and casting heal spells and stuff that Swagan might not be able to notice and could play it off like just the Triton has extra powers they didn't know about without being involved in the fight. Unfortunately, I really don't think this party is set up to do that. 
uh, for the first time. Usually we have parties parties that have those capabilities and those kind of character classes, but I don't know out of all of the, like there's just nobody who's really built for support. Everybody is just kind of direct damage themselves. So the best they could do is just attack off screen, which would definitely draw some attention, I think. DC 10 stealth check lets the character avoid drawing attention. Otherwise, use a Swagan's passive perception as normal. Which, by the way, Swagan have pretty damn good passive perception, I noticed. 15 for just a basic ass Swagan. They got a plus 5 to perception. I can't sneak up on a damn shark, I guess. Yeah, it's crazy. So 10 means they're like, dis that's like disadvantage. They're. Distracted. They all pee in the ocean. Sharks pee in you all the time. Or fish pee in you is the line. Is that the Moana line? So yeah, that's all the information there. So that was, a big, I guess, the big question I was thinking of is doesn't the arena dome prevent people from going in and out of the arena itself except for this one entrance? Or is it just open... And then, yeah, it's just can kind of erupt into chaos as it needs to. So I, I made sure to cover my bases and just put the two Sawagan champions down here. I could say that maybe there's a door somewhere else or a hatch that allows people to come and go a little bit easier. I don't know. But squaddigans. I hate having to think about the 3D. <laughs> How this stupid place is supposed to look in 3D because it just... Confused the shit out of me last week. A clear quartz dome rests on the four edges of the gallery and arches over the arena. So maybe that dome includes the gallery. Rests on the four edges of the gallery. So if they mean the edges as to be back here edges, then the dome wouldn't just include the gallery itself. In which case, yeah, you could just have all the Swagan swim in there and it wouldn't matter. I guess that might be easier to deal with logistically. I did slightly injure the Triton and the Octopus. The other thing the players aren't going to know, though, is how many hit points these two have left. And that's something I can cheat with. Do I want them to ultimately rescue the Triton? Yes, obviously. That's more fulfilling for the story. But if they just do a bunch of fuck-ups and things and they can't get to them, am I willing to kill them off? Absolutely. Literally every NPC in here is on the chopping block. Like, none of them have to survive to further the story. Uh, in fact, really, this is all kind of one big side quest, although it's getting rid of the Sawagan threat is kind of part of the main quest. What they'll really need to do is do their assassination completion. And I guess if they want to consider the mission completed from a... Better point of view with the lizard folk, probably maybe save their queen. Although I haven't determined if the queen is actually savable or not, because we need to look at level two to figure that out. Anything else about level three? Because otherwise, I think we could probably go ahead and start talking about level two for the next like three crafting sessions. Because I think that's where we're going to spend the most amount of dungeon crawling. Ugh, Demnix, fuck you, man. There's nothing wrong with my sweet Borgus. Borgu! That's not the right voice. I don't think I can do the voice right now to be in the mood. <laughs> My poor sweet, sweet little fish man. He lost his sweet Sasha, his pet eel. Uh, I was going to give him a damn seahorse, but then uh, my wife had to go and throw open the gate and let the giant seahorse run free. So poor Borges has nothing. He's picked up a spear. And yeah, he's at 15 hit points. None of them are going to heal him. He's going to fucking get murderized the second a shark goes after him and it's going to feel stupid dumb like really dumb and pointless but <laughs> my party is extremely cavalier when it comes to allied npcs shout out to like all the way back when we played lost mine of fendelver and i remember kalinar cared so much about resuscitating uh what was it gundren rock seeker or something when i tried to kill that npc i was like no 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 we gotta get him with the raised dead or something and now look where we are now. Like everybody's just like, oh, well, we lost. What's her face? Okay, well, we'll raise her up as a zombie. You know what? I'm sure Borgus, they've already talked to him. You, we've got you in the medical plan. You you will be a zombie. That's if you've signed your your papers to the group. 
and uh, that's that's it. The bad news is we don't have healing, but the good news is we do have animate dead. So your body will be used to further the cause of the party. Congratulations. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you, Lumpy. Yes, lock and fucking load. Borges's revenge. Level two. Level two is where all the things happen. I have not done anything to this map physically. But this is where all the things are. I'm just enjoying the amazing map art Bear has done, providing awesome detail in all the rooms while still making sure they look nice and watery. Looks bloody awesome. I love it. Fantastic. I don't know whether they'll come in in the upper left or upper right. That'll be exciting. Because the choice is going to be theirs, but they will arrive at one of these two destinations. God, if any of the maps look like an old school dungeon, this is the one. Look at this. It's just long hallways and square rooms. It's like I've got graph paper and that's it. <laughs> what can I do? What dungeon can I design? It's a bunch of rectangles and hallways. Yeah. All right. So we gotta do dynamic lighting and stuff. Um. So top to bottom, because they'll start in either the upper left or upper right. How did they even do the numbering on this thing? The number fucking... St oh, I get it, because that's from that's where you would enter from level 1. So 20... God, the numbering is so chaotic on this map, though. 20 is the stairs down. 21 to the right. Then you jump all the way to the other side for 22. Up for 23. Then go southeast for 24. <laughs> what madness is this? Who annotated this? Southeast to 2025, west to 26, then we're jumping up northeast to 27. <laughs> None of this makes any sense with how the numbering went. Why would you do this to me? Oh my god, this is sheer chaos. Oh no. Four, five, six, seven. Uh, I don't know where eight is. 39. And of course, jumps across the map to 40. And then 41 in the middle, 42. And that naturally it goes middle, right, left, because that makes no fucking sense. Why? Shout out to whoever decided to order the map this way. Caused me much consternation. All right, dynamic lighting, deliver us from this madness. By the way, I've caught up to X-Men 97. Oh my goodness, no spoilers, I promise. My goodness, that is a wonderful show, I will say that. I was a big, big fan of X-Men, the animated series back in the day. One of my favorite cartoons growing up helped me become a Marvel fan, which lasted throughout my, well, everything. I'm still a Marvel fan, like, 30 years later. And man, they nailed so much of that show, but that fifth episode, good lord. So fucking good. I won't say anything else about it, but it's amazing. So much dynamic lighting. Also, that theme music is, I will say, here's, here's a fun question I'll ask everybody who's watching right now. What is your favorite uh, theme song to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to limit you to an animated show. I guess you can choose anime if you want. Um, but what is your favorite theme song? I have two. I have two theme songs, and it's a really hard choice. There's some really fucking bangers out there. But I have two. I guess what one of them is. One of them uh, has lyrics, and the other does not. But I'm curious to know what all of you 
what your favorite theme song opening thing whatever to an animated show is while I mindlessly draw dynamic lighting all over this map. But yeah, the theme song for X Men's a fucking banger. <laughs> By the way, my kids fucking love it too, which is fantastic. I am overjoyed by being able to share something I thought was cool as a kid and frankly cool as an adult and see them just absolutely light up and enjoy it just like I did. It's a, it's a special kind of awesome for a parent. It's vindicating. <laughs> You're like, yes. I do I did have good taste as a kid and I still have good taste. <laughs> I remember thinking like before the internet I, I played uh uh Final Fantasy 3 back on the Super Nintendo when it was called Final Fantasy 3 and thinking it was like the greatest game ever and then like years later uh you know through internet forums or whatever Everybody's like, yeah, it's the greatest game ever. And I was like, yeah, yeah, it was. <laughs> this is common knowledge. Awesome. Yeah, good taste. Tank police. The fuck is that? G.I. Joe. I never get into G.I. Joe. I had a lot of friends who were into G.I. Joe. I couldn't get into it. It wasn't, uh, it, I mean, I don't know. I just didn't have enough supernatural stuff going on. I had a lot of friends who had the toys, though. We played with the toys. So much dynamic lighting. There's no doors in this dungeon, I'm realizing, either. It's all open, long-ass hallways. Stop making giant unbroken chains, too. Oh, fuck. Did I put that on the... God damn it. Why'd y'all let me draw that on the token layer? Mother... F Can I put it on the light layer? <gasps> Can you do that now? Can you move things to the light layer? Oh, awesome. I don't think you could do that before. DuckTales is so good. Honestly, it breaks my heart that DuckTales isn't my favorite because I love the DuckTales theme song. Also, I love the DuckTales show, the original. Uh, my oldest grew up on watching the original on the DVDs. And then, frankly, the... God, I fucked up that whole one's on the open layer. Uh, the reboot DuckTales is equally amazing. And I will make a lot of comparisons to x-men 97 and the ducktales whatever it was like 2017 or something in terms of like how well you can tell the showrunners like understood and the writers understood the original series like what made it good and they're like all right not only that but we're gonna like expand everything and build upon the you know what came before and you can tell like the respect is there like it's just real good so i would also very much sing the praises of uh that recent which I think it, it did end its run and had an incredible finale. Like, really did some awesome stuff with the story. But I think it went on for, like, three seasons. It was like, 2017 to 2020 or something, that DuckTales series. And similar to 97, they basically understood the assignment with, like, how good the original theme song was. So we're like, all right, well, we're not really going to fuck with the theme song very much. We're going to pretty much keep it as is and just, like, slightly update it and modernize it. But I can verify that show. I, I've watched I watched that whole series. It's phenomenal. Do, 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 do. So I've already told you that's not my top one that has lyrics, but it's God, it's gotta be number two. My number one may surprise you because I feel like I'm a little old. To be nostalgic about this series, I feel like people that are younger than me would be maybe more nostalgic, but damn, I did it again. If I click token, it doesn't go to token right away. I need to, I'm clicking the wrong thing. I'm getting distracted. Thankfully, you can just put things in the lighting layer. The tick. Anime is allowed to say Tenji Mew. You know what? I, uh, 
would respect from anime is uh, Cowboy Bebop, obviously, as like incredible music. I'm not a big uh, anime fan by any means, but uh, a friend a friend of mine in high school was the big anime guy. I, I had a couple that were anime fans. I never was one, but uh, he was a fellow band nerd, and he introduced me to the Cowboy Bebop soundtrack, and I was like, holy shit, <laughs> this is really good. It's super jazzy and awesome. So I did respect the hell out of that. Doom, 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 doom. Three, two, one, let's jam. Ba da ba da ba da ba da da. That was good. Yeah, tank. Is that the? That's the song, isn't it? Da 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 da. Da 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 da. It goes so fucking hard with the jazz, man. It's so good. Ugh. Talk about a weird kid in high school. That was the kind of shit I was listening to. <laughs> we had we had like good ass music too at the time. Well, kind of good, I guess. We were coming off of the high school for me was like late '90s, so we were coming off the good era of music and entering like the fucking boy band Britney Spears era. It's not. Not the best. Imagine writing just dynamic lighting lines during a crafting stream. Who would do that? I can't stop. It's weirdly cathartic. Like coloring as an adult, I guess. We're enjoying my like bright purple also. Always rock the purple whenever I can. Too many board games do not let me do purple. All right, this time you click that button and not the token button. There we go. I think we've covered the northern half pretty well, except for that one secret door area. Any guesses as to what my favorite lyrical theme song is? Oh, and the cowboy sound, cowboy bebop soundtrack on vinyl, nice. Gummy bears is great. Gummy bears marching here and there and everywhere. High adventure are beyond compare. I think it's how it goes. They are the gummy bears. Ba -da -ba -da -ba 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 -ba. Dashing and daring. I don't know the lyrics, but it's so goddamn catchy with gummy berry juice. There's something and something and sing all the chorus. As the song fills the air, gummy bears. <laughs> it was it was fucking a banger. That was a good one. Ah, oh, that's another one they need to reboot though. I think. You know the the new Ducktales. Uh, they they really cleverly wrapped in a lot of the those era of cartoons. They had like Ducktales, or sorry, the Ducktales. They Ducktales had uh, Rescue Rangers and uh, Darkwing Duck wrapped in there. They did fucking gargoyles. They had like a gargoyle thing in there at the end, like. They did some cool stuff with the, with all the different like Saturday morning cartoon era stuff. It was awesome. It is catchy as hell. I agree. That was the era, man. Nostalgia. I'm so nostalgic for it. The era of the banger theme songs. Do 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 do. No, that's uh, tailspin. Oh shit. No. Um. Give me a second. Oh, we a tailspin. Oh, we ho tailspin. It's the life we're living in with another tailspin. I think they did include some tailspin in DuckTales as well. They talked about like Cape Suzette and had some of those characters in there. Ah, I love that new DuckTales so much. All right, I'm trying to do the secret door. I don't know if that'll actually show up well on the side there. <laughs> Baloo voice actor. Don Carnage. Now we're just gonna talk about Sonny Mark Carnage. Anyway, my favorite lyrical theme song that I has to be for me number one with a bullet is the OG Pokemon 
theme song. It's so damn good. It's like triggering when you hear it. Uh, it j you can't help but just there like belt it out. Like it's just it's fucking power ballad in like the best way. And I I feel old saying that because literally that Pokemon cartoon came out when I was a high school. Like I was old. That was for kids stuff, but Pokemon was such a good fucking game. Uh, I still played the shit out of it on Game Boy, and I watched a little bit. I didn't watch a whole lot of that series because it was a little young for me, but, like, that song was a fucking banger. And I will always remember that. Was he really? I didn't even realize that. Director for the DuckTale remake. Uh, yeah, you gotta respect the song. The song is so good. It's very, it's very kiddy. Like, looking back now, it's like, oh man, this is really just kid shit. Uh, whereas the others, I can be like, okay, yeah. So I, I admit I can't return to Pokemon like I can the others. But I gotta respect that theme song. It's just so fucking good. da na na <laughs> It's just so triggering. But, so I think Pokemon is my favorite lyrical theme song. And X-Men is my favorite non-lyrical theme song. If I had to choose between the two, I would probably choose X-Men because it's just so fucking good. But yeah, there you go. Welcome to my crafting stream where I talk about <laughs> my favorite theme songs. Level two. What are the first rooms we're going to get to? It's not going to be the low numbers. It's either going to be immediately running into a secret door... That could lead to 47, 46, 42, which is a throne room. Or leads down into 40, and then 41. There's just no good way to organize this in terms of... Uh, like, usually, like, they're starting here, and you kind of expand from there when you do your prep. But right now, they could literally start in two different directions. So I'm going to have to prep this entire... Really, this entire top of that dungeon. But even then, they could just go straight south if they wanted to and end up in the bottom half of the dungeon. So, fuck me, I guess. Uh, Alright, what's in Area 40? Forty, a nearly empty shark pen. Oh, shit, this one with the telepathic lobster. <laughs> you want to talk about uh, wacky NPCs? In this dungeon, we've got the wackiest, just a completely random telepathic lobster. A seemingly ordinary lobster scuttles along the floor. This is Shern, an unassuming but most remarkable lobster. The lobster has no effective attacks and is automatically killed by any attack. He was used in their makeshift lobster fighting areas. It managed to escape its fate as a gladiator due to its strangely high level of intelligence. The lobster is limited to telepathy, though it cannot explain how it came to have this ability to communicate with any other living creature within 10 feet. The lobster has itself, named itself Shern, and it desperately wants to escape the fortress. Shern becomes aware of the characters. It attempts to communicate with one of them despite not being able to convey language. It knows the following information which it communicates through feelings and projected images. So it can't, so it, oh my god, so it actually cannot speak. Well, that's weird. So it telepathically communicates through feelings and projected images. Oh, my players will love that. Zoid. <laughs> Jijurama is so weird, man. They got like second and third and fourth chances to come back and, and do different episodes and series. And they're all pretty good, to be fair. Terrible monster lives in the temple. Two four-armed Sawagan rule this fortress. The bulk of the Sawagan forces are on the fortress's lowest level. If the party frees Shurn by returning it to the ocean, it can lead the characters to a sunken treasure of your design a few miles south of the fortress. <laughs> Shurn knows the layout of the two lowest levels of the fortress, including areas where large numbers of Sawagan gather. Talk about a weird-ass find where it's like, oh, randomly in this one room, there's an NPC who knows literally everything and is friendly to you. Oh, okay. He's also a tiny lobster that, I, I guess, if you're smart, can't be targeted by an attack. Just put him in your pocket. In fact, it literally even says, Shurn hopes to hide in a backpack, a cloak pocket, or a hood while the characters explore the rest of the fortress. 
on the one hand, obviously this is a fun opportunity to use a interesting exotic NPC ally. On the other hand, I am throwing already kind of a lot of NPC allies with them who need rescuing. So I'm not actually sold on using this telepathic lobster friend. Don't kill me for this. <laughs> uh, I am willing to hear arguments. We will hear arguments on Thursday. <laughs> Uh, as to whether or not we want to use the telepathic lobster or how we want to use it, or if we just want to say we've got enough going on here, this feels completely random. Yeah, the lobster dungeon manual. Emmanuel. Uh, give the lobster dominate person. <laughs> now the lobster is like a ghost where it possesses and controls people. It's so random though. Like, it's really random. And it even says, like, we don't know how the lobster even. It's not like there's a. A druid who's a captive somewhere whose only recourse is to awaken animals. God, that's actually a really good idea for a dungeon crawl. <laughs> Just keep you keep meeting meeting speaking animals who are confused. Um, it's just a fucking random telepathic lobster that knows everything. There's, and I, I appreciate the dungeons doing that. It's like throwing in some things for the players to deal with that isn't combat. But I don't know that. Maybe kind of a bridge too far. On the other side, what's in 39? Uh-oh, it's the occupied shark, ben, a shark pen. The not-so-empty. One of two large shark pens in the second-level fortress. Because of the seaweed. They could be hiding. Ten shell sharks swim through this room. They're always hungry. Four sharks. Wow, so you're going to put 10 in here. Well, that's kind of a shitty room, but I guess as soon as somebody swims by, the sharks could kind of attack them. Uh, next is a stack of armor, plates made from shell and coral against the wall. On each side of a plate is barbs used to affix it to an animal. Okay. So those are just full of dudes. 41 is... Looks important. The banquet hall. So I'm going to prefer to eat informally when individuals feel hunger. Use only for important functions. Celebrate a great victory for or to entertain visiting nobles. What? These Sawagan aren't entertaining visiting nobles. Uh, and it makes sense that the lizard folk would have some of these, though. The Sawagan took over the fortress. They destroyed the statue and the stone fragments. Uh, so destroyed the head. The very only lights. So where you move the banquet hall and place it so far as it's on the throne. So otherwise it's empty. This room is empty, I guess. 41 is the big old empty room. Could be. And then 42 is the throne room. Is anybody actually in the throne room at the time? Oh, the Baron is there. Okay, I think it's the Baroness who's in, not in there. She's like in her room. Baron Ketmak. High, peace, High Priestess Thadra stands at his side. Shell Sharks and Swaggin Champions. All right, so that'll be a big battle. Yeah, that'll be a fight. So that's one of their main destinations. 42, the throne room where the Baron is. I think the Baroness is in one of these side rooms. Uh, let's see. It's one, or no, it's B. 46, 47. There we go. 45, the Baroness. But she would come out into the battle, I think, right? 45? There was a battle here. Well, no, that's kind of far. Because I could separate him. He's an evil druid who true polymorphs innocent people to sheep. So that'll be a big marquee fight. And I think 37 will be the other big fight. Because that'll be the temple room. Uh, and I think I'm going to put the lizard queen in that temple room. And have it be like some crazy big ritual going on. So those will be the two main areas to build up and prepare for. Uh, so 41 looks empty, 39 will have sharks in it, and 40 does it or does it not have the telepathic lobster? I don't know. Uh, I promise I will have, we'll go over more of level two, I think, for Thursday's crafting stream, because we've only just begun to dive into this. I definitely see the party doing more of it. Hopefully we can put, 
Um, we'll have to figure out where to put Master Sliver. I think he's going on level one, but in, if there's another spot, level two, uh, we can flesh out, we can do that. I know that the only way to go from two to one is through area 20. So automatically we've got three areas the party needs to go to. They don't quite know that yet, but hopefully they'll get that information from some of their NPC allies in terms of how to access level one, uh, where the temple is, which is where some dark ritual shit's going on, and then the throne room where the actual leadership is happening. So they'll have to take out all of those folks, and they'll have to do it without alerting any other Sawagan, which is also going to be tricky for the party if I can help it. All right, I think that will do it for this Monday edition of Crafting the Deep. As always, if you enjoy the content, please check out patreon.com slash roguewatson. Shouts to Platinum Patrons, Joe, Will, Thomas, Dan, Brandon, Zenicider, Eclectic, Roleplayer, Roll, Christopher, Corey, Big Nut, John F., John L., Eric, Tyler, Nathan, Kip, Crystal, Counselor, Andrew, Dell, The Road Run, Captain Woody, 79, Stephanie, Andy, Patrick, Jason, Ismail, Amit, Olympia, Spuds, Sharni, David, William, Amnesiac, and Gold Patrons, RPG, Paper Crafts, Pretty Boy, Anna, Yuma, The Lizard, Lion, Sam, Jerome, Nathan, Fazaga, Tortoise, Scott, Ruffus, Carolyn, Jerry, Glenn, Marcus, and Mark. Thank you all very much for your support. I will see you for another crafting episode on Thursday.